Well, hi there. It is lovely to see you this morning. Happy Monday to you all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for Daily Devotions through Redeeming Life Fellowship. And today, as we're following the Redeeming Life reading plan, it's been leading us through the, the Gospel of Matthew and leading us uh, for following Jesus in his ministry and leading up to this climactic point where he's at Jerusalem and about to give his life as a ransom for many, as we had learned about a week ago, uh, that all this is, is, is going somewhere and the, the tension is building up as uh, Jesus is confronting the Pharisees and he's, he's about to be talking about the, the, the judgment that's going to be coming on these people who have seen what Jesus is doing, have heard what he said, and still reject him. As Jesus is talking about this, this day of judgment that's going to be coming on uh, Jerusalem and upon uh, the, the people who regard themselves as the people of God, but don't recognize their Messiah. They don't recognize the person who who God has sent to, to be their deliverer, that uh, this is not going to go well for them. Uh, even though Jesus desires and wants uh, wants them to, to see who Jesus is and recognize the salvation that God has brought for them through, through Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's a heavily, heavy-weighted uh, passage, uh, chapter, a, f a series of chapters, which are actually sometimes a little bit hard to digest, but uh, it's still important that we really do learn how to listen well to what Jesus is saying. And up to this point, as Jesus is prophesying and looking forward, getting our minds looking forward to this, this day when... Um, when judgment, this day of the Lord, where judgment and salvation is going to come, uh, that it's going to come when, when they're talking about the Son of Man appearing, which, if we know and recognize Jesus as the Son of Man, as Jesus is referring to the Son of Man appearing, he is referring to his second coming. What has been uh, termed in, in um, as a more sometimes technical way of saying it, in shorthand, what's called the parousia or parousia, you can pronounce it either way that you like, that basically uh, assumes that Jesus, uh, that um, it, through his ministry, his ministry it leads to his death, his death leading to his resurrection, his resurrection leading to his ascension, but that uh, after his ascension, for however long we, we don't know, uh, that he's actually going to come back, uh, in that the... That if if in his life in his earthly ministry two thousand years ago that he inaugurated the kingdom of God, bringing it here so that it's moving in force, its presence is here, it's working in history, it's transforming lives, that its work will not be finished totally, completely, and thoroughly until he comes back, and that's why the early church, you know, prays, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, that, that our hearts should be aching and, and looking forward to that day when Jesus returns. And, uh, and so what we have here uh, is actually uh, leading up to the, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats, which a lot of us know, are a series of three parables, that uh, one of which was dealt with uh, yesterday, Sunday, but at least two of them in our reading passage today in Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 30 uh, are referring to basically what it means to be ready for the parousia, for uh, Christ's second coming when he returns so that whenever that day comes that that we're going to be ready for it. And what I find so fascinating about these particular parables is that they're, they're not comprehensive. In other words, to say, here's a laundry list that you can check off, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and that once those things are done, your bags are packed, uh, your house is set in order so that when Jesus comes, everything's going to be hunky-dory. That's not what we're offered. What we're offered are parables. Which, again, as we've talked about before, that parables have a way of messing with your mind, but also trying to 
get past the mental clutter and down to a heart issue so that your heart is prepared as change is affected so that when um, that, that that you become so the sort of person that that this parable intends to make you to be and so uh, and so what you'll find here and our focus is really primarily uh is going to be on the first of the two parables that are within this reading section. The second one uh, is referring to the parable of the talents. That ver that's verses, I believe, forty th or fourteen through thirty. And in summary, the one thing that you can say about the parable of the talents, where uh, this master calls in his servants, he entrusts uh, sections or portions of them with their wealth. And while he's gone, they put it to work and they bring back an investment and all is well. And what is so fascinating about that parable, and you can read it on your own time, but remember this, is that the, the last servant, the one who's entrusted with one talent, is condemned. Not because he had done something wrong, but, but because he did nothing where he, God had entrusted something to, to, to him and he expected him to actually put it to work in somehow, in some measure, that God gives us his gifts, he gives us his the talents, he entrusts us with uh, resources, opportunities, and expects us to do something with them. In that, in the same way, a master would be would, would regard a servant who he expects to put what was entrusted to him to work and call him wicked and lazy, that uh, the danger for us, indeed oftentimes, is that we're too afraid to take the things that God gives us and put it to work and, uh, and suppose that as long as we don't do anything wrong with it, then, then things are going to be fine. A gift that goes unused is as good as no gift at all. Uh, and what God entrusts to you, he expects you to put to good use. So that this time that you're waiting while he's he's gone, but will we'll return, this is the time to be uh, for blood, sweat, and tears to be putting the things that God has entrusted to us to work that brings forth uh, a, a good and lasting return. But, we're actually not going to talk about that 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 parable, but talking about the parable of the ten virgins, which I admit it is one of the parables. Similarly, for lay people and scholars alike, is actually very difficult to interpret because, like, so many weddings, and I think I'm sure you've been to many of them. I've been to several of them, some that I enjoyed, others that I tolerated, some others that I just frankly endured because it seemed as, seems as though uh, we're well past the stage of doing what might be considered a traditional wedding where every single one has to be unique and different and lovely and, uh, and somehow fits some kind of, you know, stereotypical image of some Disney princess wedding. I don't know. Um, have you seen how much how expensive some weddings are? It is scandalous, uh, which is why I'm so glad that I married the woman I married because she's wonderful. But I digress. We're not here to talk about our marriage. We're talking about this wedding, this uh, particular wedding, not our wedding. Uh, but you've been at that or certainly been at some weddings where you're looking at the, the, the ceremony and this person's doing this and that person's doing that. And you've just really felt lost because you really didn't feel like you knew like what the customs were that were going on. You feel as comfortable there as you would be in a shotgun wedding. And it's just weird because there's no frame of reference to figure out who's doing this and who's what's doing that because it's well, that's just what happens to be going on. Reading a parable like this, which also happens to be about a wedding, that's that's the central occasion around which the story the the, the 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 narrative unfolds is like that and uh, we are really at a loss when it comes to say here's what's happening and we have some kind of understanding 
about, you know, the way in which these ancient uh, uh, weddings would typically go on. The, the customs are foreign, but that's what we expect. And so this means this and that means that. And so reading a parable like this, you just have to find the extra biblical stuff to be able to try and fill in the blanks and everything makes sense. There's nothing like that. And it is very, very difficult, even though there's enough plain sense in the reading of this text that helps us to be able to get our minds around what it is that Jesus is saying and what it means for us to be ready for when he returns. There's, there's two ways to think about readiness, or at least two aspects that we want to try and bear in mind when we're thinking about readiness. Uh, one of them is being about the readiness that comes from knowing when something is going to happen. So if I am taking a class and I look in the syllabus and realize there's a test, you know, a midterm, you know, somewhere in November or something and mark down, there's the test. I know when it happens and I'll show up to take that test when that, when, when the date comes in that sense, I'm ready for the test and present for when it, when it happens. But then surely you and I have, have known or experiences where we've taken tests and by the end of it had put down our pens and realized I was not ready for that. The questions, the challenges, the, the, this, this was a total curveball. I had no idea that this was going to be going on, that they were going to ask this question or that question. And that when you, when you, you reflect on, on, whether or not you were going to be, you were, you were, you had done well or didn't do well in the test, that you're, th you, it's easy to reflect back on your study or lack of study uh, and think like, if I had known that that's what the question was, or this was what, what the test what was going to be on the test, I would have prepared differently. I would have done things different. I would have put aside my partying. I put aside my binge watching on Netflix. I would have put aside, uh, you know, the, the just scrolling through Facebook, uh, you know, it, you, you know, as it keeps going and going and going and going and going. Um, and I would have put all those things aside so that I could have actually devoted more time and more energy to be prepared for a test like this. And, uh, and there's, there's that sense of readiness that's in view. And I'll tell you, do you, you know, I hope everybody has this experience at least once in their lives where they go to take a test and they have been studying well. They knew the material frontwards and backwards so that when they were sitting down to take the test, that they could almost with um, muscle memory put in all the right answers and torch that thing and saying, that was great. I was ready. I had been I be, that that I was ready for what was happening because I knew how to use my time and my energies wisely to prepare for this day when it was going to come. And it's that sense of readiness that we want to have that we need to have in anticipation for when Jesus returns and it's that sense of readiness that that Jesus wants us to grasp when we're reading the parable of the ten virgins. So, let's read. So, uh, this is Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. It says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with the lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now, isn't it interesting in this case where the situation that's at hand, that these virgins or bridesmaids, or it, this isn't a harem, these are, these are guests who are being invited to come to the wedding, and they're that that for whenever it is that they were expecting the bridegroom to show up, he didn't come when it was that he was expecting. They were forced to wait 
longer, considerably longer, for whatever reason. Who knows? Uh, but they were forced to wait longer than what they were expecting, which nobody likes. We all hate delayed flights, delayed appointments, uh, when you expected something to come and it didn't come when you expected it. And you're just forced to wait. Uh, that in the same way, our waiting is prolonged, it's protracted, even as we are still waiting for the second coming of Jesus to, to, to come. And to that extent, it is important, I think it's necessary, that Jesus tells this type of parable to know that, that however or whenever it is that Jesus is coming, it's not going to be when it is that we expect. We, If we had been reading carefully a few verses earlier in the previous chapter, we would have known that. But uh, whatever the case is, this part does help drive that, that home. And so, and it says, at midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. And I hear there's actually a very important point that France, I think, rightly notes or draws from this parable. And that is that this does serve as a warning that preparedness is the sort of thing that falls on our shoulders. It's our responsibility and that our readiness for the coming of Jesus, whenever it is he comes, is not the sort of thing that we can shruff off to somebody else. That whether or not we are prepared for when that day comes, that's on us. Nobody's going to make you be prepared. Nobody's going to force you today to be using your time and energies wisely in a way that is pleasing to God so that when that day comes, you'll say, great, this is wonderful. I'm ready. It couldn't come soon enough. Let's do this. And that you won't be left scrambling. Or to buy into the false belief that preparedness for something like this is something you could do instantly. It's, it can't happen. When this day comes, you'll know whether or not that you've been preparing for this. So, let's continue. And mind you, the sense of preparedness in this case, uh, if we're trying to think about what it is that we're doing in the meantime that prepares us for a coming day like this, it's certainly to put our living faith and hope and trust in Jesus and following him with, with an obedient and eager and loving heart that, um, that reflects what life in the kingdom is like. And for that, we should be jumping back to the Beatitudes, but that's another matter. Let's get back. Uh, verse 20 or chapter 25, uh, let's see here, verse 10. But when, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. Now, it does seem a little bit interesting that this bridegroom would regard wedding guests who he invited and say that they don't know them. But this is to drive home the point that the day is going to come where there is going to be some kind of separation between those who are indeed uh, uh, have a belongingness to the, the, the kingdom of God and fellowship with, with a living God uh, and, and those who are left outside who um, think that they ought to be ought to be in, but they won't be because they weren't ready. And it says, therefore, yes, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Verse 13. Uh, but yeah, this, this lands on uh, a note of disassociation, darkness, being shut out, which I don't want anybody to have to, to, to deal with. But if we don't want to, to be like you know, uh, foolish virgins, uh, bridesmaids, uh, guests of the, of the wedding party. The decision begins today. Uh, as a matter of fact, it begins yesterday. 
Uh, and it's going to be uh, the, 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 um, whether or not we're going to be prepared for when Jesus comes begins with the choices that we make today. Even as I reflect on this thing, this this parable, it actually uh, reminds me of a, a quote from a movie, Deepwater Horizon, with Mark Wahlberg, where uh, where uh, he's a little bit put off by um, some big wig who comes into his you know this oil rig and tries to tell him what to do. He gives this this uh, this this memorable quote that says, "Hope ain't a tactic." In other words, just because you're hoping for the best doesn't mean that you're ready for it. Uh, in that you can put off the time or the occasion as long as it is that you want, but uh, whether or not you're ready is, is based upon whether or not that you've been preparing for a day like that. And that you can, you can hope for the best, but false or empty hopes won't prepare you for the day when the Lord comes. Just hoping for the best is not a tactic, but diligence, vigilance, uh, preparedness, devoting your time and your energy and your thoughts, focusing them on God, devoting your energies on things that matter, uh, putting your time to good use. All of those things should prepare us for the day so that our hopes are filled uh, because um, we have been longing for, expecting, preparing, looking forward to the day when Jesus returns, because that is going to be a glorious, glorious day uh, for those who uh, have been eager and for 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 His return. So I pray that 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 fills your heart with hope for the day when He returns. Perhaps today uh, is the day when when He will come, or perhaps tomorrow. But we want to be ready for it. And uh, we need to live our lives in a way today that, uh, that eagerly anticipates what it is that the Lord intends to do in and through us when he returns. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, enjoy Daily Devotions. I hope you're enjoying it. I'm enjoying it today. Maybe it's the coffee, but uh, it always helps. But yeah, if you, uh, if you haven't, do uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can get daily notifications. And also hope that we're going to be able to meet together soon, uh, be it on Wednesdays or Sundays, because all of this is so good uh, uh, through the, the, these daily devotions, but it's so much better when we get to meet together. So God bless you, uh, Lord keep you, and may we all uh, live in a way that anticipates and prepares it is that the, the will be prepared uh, and ready like the wise virgins for when the day he returns. So God bless you. Take care.